<clears throat> Take me home, Lord. <laughs> Excellent. We're going to get into our study here this morning, uh, some recovery from last week. Um, so, just these texts just burden my heart with, uh, with where we are. And anyway, I'll try and be careful. Sorry, Matthew 24, 24, verse 1 today. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you see all these things? And surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? We started off on this last week. just want to touch on this. The disciples are much like us. We're much like the disciples. We want to know the details. We want to know the timing. What should we be looking for? You know, you said all this stuff's going to happen, so, you know, what? Give, give us the pieces. But Jesus doesn't start with those details. As a matter of fact, throughout the whole discussion, he actually doesn't give them very many. And if you've ever sat through any study of the end times, whether it's from the book of Daniel or any of the other prophets, from Revelation or anything else, you'll find out there really aren't a whole lot of specific details much to our frustration because everybody wants to know the details. But that's not where Jesus starts. And we got to learn this, folks, because this is, this is so important for everyday living, let alone facing the end times. Jesus answers and says to them, take heed that no one deceives you. Now, I want to set the stage here for a moment. I should have drawn this. I knew I should have drawn this when I got here today. Let's start with our background. God is in the Holy of Holies. Through Jesus and his blood, we enter into God's family. The relationship with God is restored. Jesus came to sever us from the relationship to the spirit of this world. Jesus came to loose us out of this relationship so that we might engage in this relationship. And as Jesus is talking to his disciples, this is where they are right now. He had found them and said, come follow me, and they had been following Jesus. Jesus knows he's going to be leaving. He knows that the Holy Spirit's going to be coming. He also knows that there's all going to be kinds of things happen in this earthly realm and there's deceivers who are going to come what's deception all about whose voice we will follow whose voice will we seek whose words will dictate how you and I live this whole thing everything from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation is about the placement of our faith. I know I've talked about it for all the years I've been here. I talk about it every Sunday. I'm going to talk about it until every Sunday until I leave the face of this earth. And then maybe I'll leave behind pictures of this so that it'll still keep going on because there's nothing more important than our faith. We either live with God or we exist in hell based upon where we put our faith. So Jesus is answering his disciples' questions and says, here's the most important thing you guys need to know. Don't be deceived. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. 
All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Reiterate where we've been and where I firmly stand on what I see the scriptures say. The church believers are going to experience tribulation. Whether it's the tribulation of the end times or whether it's just today. This week for me in one sense was tribulation. Because whatever came hit hard. The ironic thing was, I had been to the doctor in the morning for an annual physical. Everything was perfect. They listened to my heart. They listened to my lungs. You're clean as a whistle. I felt great. Two o'clock Monday afternoon, boom, it was all over. <laughs> Tribulations come. In different forms. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you'll be hated by all nations for my namesake. Interesting. Jesus doesn't say who they are. The Lord says, oh, by the way. All the buildings of the temple and everything are going to be torn down. More than likely it's the same they. But they're going to deliver you up to tribulation. They're going to hate you. They're going to hate you because you're associated with the building. Or the God who dwells in the building. So they're going to come after you too. And then many will be offended. Now again, he doesn't really define who those people are. You guys know any Christians that ever get offended? If not, just pick about five or six and go have lunch with them today. <laughs> and listen to what they talk about. Somewhere in there, you'll probably find out one of them is probably offended about something. We're offended easily. And we'll betray one another. And we'll hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Now let's not miss some of the things that Jesus is saying. Guys, it doesn't matter what the timing of the events are. It doesn't matter what signs may come prior to. What you need to be concerned about is the condition of your faith with me. Because when all this stuff starts to unfold and you start being on the attacked end of all of this stuff that's against God, it's going to be hard to hang in there. It's going to be hard to stand fast with me. Because all kinds of deceivers are going to come and try and tell us that they have the solution. That they have the way of escape. To just come and follow me and, and I'll help you out. The love of many will grow cold. We're very, very familiar with that little statement. but understand the magnitude of what he means when he says it. Love is a fruit of who God is. And if believers' love grows cold, it means they've walked away from that relationship. That's why the love grows cold. Because I've walked back out here. Because this is where love doesn't exist. So if my love begins to grow cold, I am listening to the wrong voice. I'm taking the counsel of the error one.
let us not forget what faith is. Faith begins with someone speaking. You and I listen to that voice and choose it as truth and then align our lives to it. We obey it. That combination is faith. So I'm either listening to God's voice or I'm listening to somebody else's. And the deceiver comes to try and get us away from listening to God's voice. Saints, believers are those who have made God their faith object. But again, folks, let's not be fooled. When you and I, when anybody comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ, we come with all kinds of baggage. Because out here in the world, we have been taught to trust all kinds of different voices. I go to one voice for financial advice. I go to a different voice for medical advice. I go over here for advice about this. I go over here for advice about that. I go to a car mechanic to get my car fixed. I don't expect one voice to cover all of the areas of my life. In addition to that, over the years, certain voices have failed me. So I don't pay attention to them anymore. And I put some other voice in their place. We have a need in our lives. We start asking for people for opinions. Well, who would you recommend? That's how we come into our relationship with God. With all these other voices that we're already listening to on a daily basis about all kinds of different things. Those voices don't immediately go silent. And one of the reasons why is because when you and I are shared the gospel from a do you want heaven when you die perspective. All we have done is added God to that pile of voices. The process of sanctification of discipleship is then taking all those other voices and eventually moving our faith from them to God. That takes time. Because most of the time, you and I don't even know what voices we're listening to. So we stand here in a relationship with God, but in our daily lives, there's all these other things dictating to us. And unless we mature to where God becomes the singular voice, when tribulation really begins to break loose in the earth, Understand, we're standing here watching all this stuff unfold and now it's beginning to affect our lives. And we've got our voices talking to us. And somewhere in there is God's. It's going to be very easy to make decisions based upon the voices we've always listened to. These are the things that Jesus is talking to his disciples about. It's what he's talking to us about. False prophets come on the scene. There will be many of them. Walk this way, walk that way, go over here, do this, do that. Here's how we're going to get through this. To which we need to be saying, okay, but what's God saying? You may have the answer, but I'm going to talk to God first. I want to find out, are you saying what he's saying? As we study the end times, we have to look at it from the viewpoint of what the church is going to experience. There's a doctrine that covers a lot of Christianity that came about in the 1800s. It's very, very appealing. I understand why, because nobody wants to suffer. 
and it's the doctrine of the pre-trib rapture. Now again, I'm not here to argue one way or the other. What I'm here to say is, first of all, I, have, I can't find that scripturally. Second of all, it, it easily entraps people into staying immature. It's appealing in the sense of, I don't have to experience it. I won't be here. But what that does is it keeps people from maturing. My contention is, if it's wrong, we're not prepared. We're not prepared for what's coming. And that's going to be detrimental in a lot of different ways. Does God know the difference between believers and unbelievers? Absolutely. Is he going to make a separation between the two? Absolutely. When's that going to happen? When he says so. And we haven't got to the end of chapter 24 of Matthew yet where Jesus actually kind of talks about that and then he expounds upon it in Matthew 25. But based on what Jesus tells us, there's going to be a whole lot of tribulation and great tribulation come before he ever does the separation. So we need to take a hard look at it. We function too much out of fear of tribulation, yet quote Paul writing to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. Right? But we're terrified of tribulation. And naturally, when you start reading this stuff, you look at it and say, well, yeah, of course we're terrified of this. But let me reread a portion from last week out of Daniel chapter 7, page 2 of the notes. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7. Uh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 11. Where he's talking about the kings that have made an agreement, but now they're not going to be in agreement anymore, and there's this king who's just going to terrorize everything. Daniel 11, verse 32 says this, But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who, who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. And some of those of understanding shall, shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white, until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. We need to get a picture of this. In the midst of being under great persecution, in the midst of being hunted down, in the midst of being hated by the things of this world, we still are doing great exploits. This is the power that Paul's talking about when he says God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of power. That in the midst of suffering, God's still flowing through me. That I'm not coiled up in a corner somewhere, terrified, but I'm actively being about the kingdom stuff in the midst of it. You understand there's a difference between the two. You say, well, that's a nice thought. Okay, I'll prove it to you. It's in the notes. Let's read section out of uh, Acts chapter 8. The church has started. People are being added to the church daily. Acts chapter 8. Now Saul was consenting to his death. This is the stoning of Stephen. I call that tribulation. At least on Stephen's case. From his point of view. But remember, even as he was being stoned, what Stephen said, I see the Lord sitting at the right hand of the majesty. Stephen wasn't terrified. Stephen was standing in the power of God while his body was being pummeled by rocks. And he says, I see the kingdom.
At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, was at which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now, I'll, I'll admit, I, I've been guilty most of my life of reading a section like this, thinking, okay, persecution broke out, and they were like, oh man, we can't be here, we've got to go. From the standpoint of being fearful. But then it struck me this morning and yesterday when Jesus sent out the 12 and later out sent out the 70. And he says, when you go into a town and they're not interested in you, then you leave. Not out of fear. Just recognize they're saying, we don't want you here. You say, okay, and I leave. What's persecution here happening in Jerusalem saying? We don't want you here. So they leave. Now again, because we tend to read the scriptures out of this fleshly, earthly body, we look at it and say, of course they ran. I'd run too. <laughs> Fearful about what they might do to me. They just stoned Stephen. We need to read this differently. You don't want me here? Fine. I'll go elsewhere. Because wherever I go, there's going to be somebody who needs the gospel. And that's what I'm about. There's a huge difference here. And let's watch it play out. Verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. These aren't fearful people. They simply picked up and left and said, okay, fine. And wherever they went to, it's like, you know what? You guys need to hear about this Jesus Christ. They're not fearful. They're bold in the power of God in their lives. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. In the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Obviously, Philip was not very terrified about persecution. He simply went to another place and continued to proclaim the gospel. And the power of God flowed through him, touching and changing lives. I started getting a little angry this week at how long I've let the enemy just convince me about this fear thing. And messed up my whole understanding of the scripture simply because it's like, oh yeah, you know, persecution comes, everybody runs. There's a difference between running because of fear and running because, fine, you don't want me, I'll leave. Paul talks to Timothy in his second letter about people in the end times. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. You say, well, he we can't be talking about the church there. Well, to a large degree, he isn't. But folks, if I'm not walking with God then these other attributes are going to be true of my life because it's the power of God in me that causes me to lay down my life for someone else and without his power in my life I will not lay down my life for someone else The fear of persecution, trials, and tribulations should not be the believer's focus. Our focus must be in the God who loves us, the God who sustains us, the God who enables us, who stands with us, and leads us in victory over every temptation.
page 3 of the note, 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 1, begin verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. Hear that. Your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other. See those two things connected again? Faith in God growing, and so does their love for other people. Well, of course it's happening because they're in a great place and everything's going hunky-dory. Mm, that's not what it says. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Their faith is maturing and their love for other people is growing at great measure because they're doing something productive with their persecutions. They're drawing near to God. In the midst of tribulation, they're exercising their faith in Him and shutting down every other voice that's trying to lead them away from Him. And Paul says, we're taking notice. And I'm talking about you where I go. He assures them that God will, in fact, deal with those who are troubling them in the day that he comes. <clears throat> but that's a long way off. Verse 11, therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of his faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him. I've always liked the way that those two things tend to go together in the scriptures. That God will be glorified in you and you in him. When people look at you, they see who God is. And when they're reminded about who God is, they think of you. That's becoming one with the Father. Paul writes on, though, to them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And are gathering together to him. Notice what Paul's addressing. The coming of Jesus and our gathering together with him. We ask you not to soon be shaken or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you. Here it is again. Let no one deceive you. That day will not come. Unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who exalts and opposes himself above all that's called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Last week we read Daniel 7 and 11, Revelation 13. This is what Paul's talking about here at the church at Thessalonica. There are things that are coming prior to the return of Jesus and our gathering to him. Don't be deceived. The deception in leading us away from God isn't just about when tribulation occurs. The deception also includes and it's one of my frustrations with, with the pre-trib doctrine, is it simply weakens people. If I'm not going to have to go through it, I don't need to train for it. Well, if I'm not training for it, then what am I doing with my time? What am I doing with my energy? Oh, more importantly, what am I doing with my faith? 
if I'm not in training, if I'm not exercising and developing my faith relationship with God in preparation for something that's coming, then what am I doing with my faith? Well, all the voices around me are telling me all these things I should be doing, being involved in, buying, possessing. And all those voices are coming from out here and telling me to reattach into the world. So if I reattach into the world and then tribulation comes, now my heart's torn because I don't want to lose all the stuff that's in the world. When persecution comes and the place where I'm living says, we don't want you, I say, yeah, but I want all this stuff. And we start to have conflicts. Too often the enemy gives us information that he simply uses to weaken us and weaken us and weaken us. I like the pre-trib doctrine from the ideal standpoint of not wanting to suffer. I get it. I really, really get it. But the Word doesn't tell us that. It tells us just the opposite. Verse 5, do you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, I, I, I'm using this other part here to... <clears throat> to talk about um, being careful, not being deceived. When I was taught the pre-trib rapture, this is one of the sections that you have to deal with. What do you do with this? Who's the he that's restraining and what's it mean when he's moved out of the way? Well, those who taught me the pre-trib doctrine said, well, the one who's restraining is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit's removed, then the enemy's allowed to do all this chaos. But the theory goes on and says, well, when the Holy Spirit's removed, he takes the church with him. And that's how they get to this understanding that we're not here when all this stuff happens. To which then I ask the questions of, but okay, but what about Daniel and what about Revelation where the church is being persecuted by the thing that's being unleashed in the world when the restrainer's removed. Where do those saints come from? And the reply normally is, well, those are the ones who get saved during the tribulation. But again, the scripture doesn't tell us that either. Let's understand some things from the word. God doesn't have to remove himself completely from the atmosphere for evil to go on. Evil seems to be going on pretty good right now. Right? And yet, and yet we know, according to the scriptures, that God is also here. Right? The Holy Spirit's working in the lives of people. He's here. And yet evil's working. You see, God doesn't have to leave. All he has to do is say, According to my plan, because again, that's what Paul's talking about. According to God's plan, God's timing, God says, it's time. Go ahead. People look at me like, okay. <clears throat> Last week we read in Revelation, and you're familiar with this, at the sounding of the, at the fifth trumpet, Right? There's these horse, scorpion-looking things that come into the earth. Right? Where do they come from? According to the text, where do they come from? The bottomless pit. 
How do they get out? According to the text, at the sounding of the fifth trumpet, one comes and opens it up and lets them out. Did God simply depart from the earth? No. He simply said, you can now stop restraining them and let them out. This is what Paul's talking about here. Understand, during the tribulation, God is still here. It's why the saints do great exploits, because the Spirit's still here. Man, my cry would be, God, if you're going to leave, don't leave me here. Because I can't do this without you. This is why, folks, we have to be careful with some of this stuff. Yes, it's appealing to the flesh. But that's what the enemy appeals to all the time. The flesh. There is no indication in the scriptures that God just suddenly disappears. And then all this stuff happens. What we find is God releases his hand and says, okay. Because at the same token, when that season is over, God says, you're done. Right? Yeah. How do we get through the things that we face each and every day? Because God is present. Because his word is faithful. Because he is faithful. <coughs> All right, you need a little more. Fine. Page four of the notes, Hebrews 3. The falling away must come first. Again, very few people really like to hear this. But if we simply ignore it as though it's not possible, and we, we set ourselves up. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. In the writer of Hebrews is addressing the same issue. It's where a person's faith is placed. In whom is it placed? And he says, sin comes along and is deceitful, wanting to lead us astray. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard it rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he hungry? Was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see they could not enter into because of unbelief. Now, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the Exodus. And he's saying... Guys, look. Who are all the people that died in the wilderness? What was their condition? What was going on? What was the problem going on with them? What led to their rebellion? Well, gee, I don't know. A guy led them to a place where they didn't have any water. Yeah, well, in Revelation... When the seals and the trumpets are opened, we find fresh water supplies being corrupted. So you have water, you just can't drink it. Kind of the same thing in not having water. There were times they didn't have any food. Well, gee, I read that in Revelation too. You see, the Israelites were experiencing forms of tribulation. But instead of developing their relationship with God... They kept looking back at where they had come from. And they rebelled against God.
So, to all those who are sitting here or will see this or hear this at some point, I have some questions for you. Not to be a smart aleck, but it happens at times. Turn to page five of the notes real quick. <clears throat> I'll talk through some of this. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says to them, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. He reiterates in verse 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I want you to think about, as I ask these questions, how we would define the spiritual condition of the people who came out of Egypt, first of all, after they had put the blood on their doorposts and the death angel passed through and they were alive. Think about that. <clears throat> they were saved by the blood, were they not? And they were saved because they had obeyed what God said about the blood. Then God leads them down to the Red Sea for a reason. And as Pharaoh's army comes, the one who lorded over them for generations comes to get them back God parts the waters, leads them through, and then swallows up Pharaoh's army so that it can't do that anymore. Now what is their spiritual condition? They've been saved by the blood. They've come through the water because they've been following what God says to do. The first two pieces of furniture that you encounter in the temple is the altar of burnt offering and the wash basin. Symbolic of the blood of an animal that dies so that I can be free. And the cleansing of baptism that I might enter in as a priest. What Paul is describing to the church at Corinth, he says the people that came out of Egypt were under the blood. They passed through the sea. And God brings them out into the wilderness to himself. And he says what? If you will walk with me, I will make you a kingdom of priests. Understand Paul saying, guys, right here is where the Israelites stood spiritually. This is where they were standing in the wilderness. With God in a cloud and a pillar of fire right here. And when they had no water, they said... That guy brought us out here to kill us. And how many people do that to God today? When they hear a diagnosis they weren't expecting. Why God? I thought you loved me. 
Yes, even out of the mouths of Christians. I gave my life to you. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I've been part of the church for generations. How could you do me like that? Do not think that we're not easily deceived if we haven't built our faith in God. Now I know everybody looks at this and says, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit. That's why they did what they did. We have the Holy Spirit now. Well, praise God we do. But how many times in a daily basis do I hear what the Spirit say and say, no, I don't want to do that. The Spirit are fighting over a donut. And I call it tribulation, and he says, you're an idiot. I love you, Tim, but come on. If I tell you no over a donut, don't you dare look at me and call it tribulation. Let's spend some time in the Word and get a new definition of what tribulation is. The writer of Hebrews writes to the church saying you need to mature and says to them, because if you don't, you're susceptible. Paul writes to the church at Corinth and says, guys, you're susceptible. Let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. Jesus saying to his disciples, here's what I need you to hear out of me the most. Don't be deceived. Because regardless of what happens and when it happens, there's going to be suffering in the earth that suffering is going to be turned against the church. And the only thing that's going to help us at any moment in that time is our faith. And it needs to be planted in God. Everybody okay? Let me read this next section and then I'll finish with a few thoughts. Page 6 of the notes, back to Matthew 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babes in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Not overly comforting words. But hear what Jesus is saying. Don't be deceived. Tribulation is coming. And then guys... That's going to be followed by something even worse. And unless God shortened those days, even believers would lose their faith in God. Now, I know I just used a word I shouldn't have used in the Baptist church. Lose. Give up is actually the operative word. No one loses their faith. We take it from one place and put it elsewhere. And that's this whole discussion. 
According to the scriptures, we are saved by grace through faith. And we are kept for glory by faith in God. But the exercise of our faith always remains with us. The Holy Spirit comes alongside us to encourage us, to strengthen us, to call our attention to when our faith is waning, to draw us unto God, to highlight and start pulling scriptures into our minds to keep us focused on God. The Holy Spirit works over time to keep our faith planted in God. But what you and I do with our faith still is up to us. So it's not a matter of losing faith. It's a matter of deciding, am I going to keep it in God or am I going to choose to believe something else? And this is all what Jesus is talking about. And he's talking about a time that's coming to these guys where he says, look, it's going to be bad. Every single believer's faith is going to be tested to some measure that it's hard to fathom. But the prophecy of Daniel says you'll do great exploits. Because if we keep our faith exercised in God, the power of the Creator sustains us. So he says, look, guys, when you see this stuff starting to happen and you see the temple going down in flames, leave. Get out. If we are on the top of the house, don't get out and try and gather your gatherings. Get out. If you're in the field, don't go back to the house. Leave. You don't need your possessions. You say, oh, yes, I do. No, 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 folks. Again, this is why... Faith in God is so crucial. And yes, I get to write it up here. Genesis 15, 1. Why can I run from the field and just take off? Because God has promised to be my supply. I don't need the stuff that I'm leaving behind. I don't need anything else but Him. Because He's faithful and He's proven it to me. He creates water in the desert. He brings food when I need it. He supplies the nourishment my concern is walk with him and the power of God then will enable me to carry his message wherever I end up. And that's why Jesus says, and this gospel will be preached in all the ends of the earth. Not because we're running for fear. Because we're simply recognizing the situation saying, there's a power here that doesn't want us. I'm going elsewhere. But as I go elsewhere, I'm going with my God and I'm taking his message of salvation wherever I go. A warrior. Not fearful. That's what Jesus is trying to say to his people. Everybody okay? Get in there this morning. You stay with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, there's always so much to say. But Lord, I just pray, take these words and bring them home to us and help us to see the truth. That Heavenly Father, that we walk with you and in the power of your might, not to wield at our pleasure, but not to be fearful. And have victory, Lord God, over every false doctrine, over every false prophet, over every deceiver, over every temptation. You give us the word, the power, the authority to take every thought captive. Lord, may we engage in the training so that we're prepared in those days. In Jesus' name we pray.